My name is Clay Thomas. I'm the worship pastor here. Family Sunday, Spring Forward Sunday. It's a great Sunday. Windy Sunday, all sorts of kind of Sundays today. Glad you're here. I know we got kids in the room. Kids, I'm super glad you are with us this morning. Um, I've got two kids of my own. I've got Griffin, who's three, and Ford, who's two. And I love these boys. A lot of times I'll come home and uh, I just got off from work. I walk into the door and Ford will come up to me and he'll say, go. I'm like, hey, good to see you too, buddy. But he'll say, go, go hide, go hide. And I was like, all right, so I'll go and hide. They love playing hide and go seek. They do it all the time. They're obsessed with it. So I'll go hide and they'll count to 10 and they'll come and find me. And I remember teaching this game to my oldest, Griffin. And because uh, Ford was a little too young at this time when, uh, when we were playing this. But we were teaching Griffin how to play hide and go seek. And so uh, I'd say, hey, I'm going to count to 10. You go hide, and I'm going to come find you. So I'm in the living room counting to 10. Griffin runs off, and, and so I say, ready or not, here I come. And I start walking through the, through the hallway, and not even five seconds into this game, I hear this beep. I'm like, okay, I'm just saying where he's at. And I go into the bedroom, and he goes, right here. <laughs> I'm like, dude, do you not know how to play hide and go see? Let, let me just walk through this one more time with you. You're going to go hide. And you don't want me to find you. So don't make a sound, right? You got to be quiet. And he's just like smiling. He's like, okay, okay. And so I go and uh, go back in the living room. I say, all right, I'm going to count to 10 again. You go hide and be quiet. And so uh, I count to 10. So ready or not, here I come. And I start walking around. Five seconds goes by. And I'm like, all right, I don't know where he's at. Start walking into the bathroom. No one's in there. Start walking into our bedroom. No one's in there. I go into his bedroom, and I'm like, man, Griffin is doing such a great job of being quiet and silent, and I hear about five feet away from me under, the, under a blanket, he goes, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, there he is. I love, love my boys. They're so funny. They keep me on my toes for sure. Something I love uh, doing with my boys is just teaching them new things, like a game like hide and go seek. I love teaching them how to how to share, even though they don't really learn that well how to share. I love teaching them all kinds of stuff. As they grow up, I'm so excited to teach them all kinds of different things. I'm excited to learn about their personalities more and more. I want to hear how they interact with people. I want to see their their relationships they they get into, their friendships. I want to know who they are. I want to experience pain with them. I want to experience joy with them. I want to do life with my boys. If you are a parent uh, and your kids are in here, you, you experience that. You feel that. You want to know everything that's going on. Some of us, we do that to the extreme and we kind of do this helicopter thing, but it's just because we love them so much and we want to know exactly what's going on in their lives and we want to teach them these things. And I can, I can teach my boys all day um, about life and how to interact with people and how to be what I tell Griffin is, hey, we're going to be sweet, nice, and kind and loving to our, our classmates and to our teacher because he goes to this PDO. And, and so he's trying to learn that. And, and sometimes he'll come back and be like, Dad, I was, I was sweet, nice, and kind today. And other times I was like, hey, were, were you sweet, nice, and kind? And he goes, nope. You know? And so we're learning. But I love, I love teaching them this stuff. And uh, I, I just I want to be invested in their lives. Parents, you, you feel that. You know that. You want to be invested in your kids. The, the hard thing for me to accept is that my boys are going to kind of determine the relationship they, that we have because I am constantly going to love them. I am always going to be for them. I'm always going to pursue them and, and want to do life with them and ask them these questions and interact with them and, and want to know how school's going, want to know how relationships are going, and, and they don't have to accept any of that that I offer. Any guidance I give them, they don't have to accept it. They can choose how much they want to share with me. They can choose how much they want to do life with their dad, how, how relational they want to be with their dad. And, and the thing is, we've got this heavenly father who loves us, who has this reckless love for us. He pursues us like we sang about, and it's constant. And there's, there's just like my son can do nothing to make me love them more, our father, we, we can't do anything to make him love us 
more, and he wants this relationship with us. He is interactive. He wants to communicate to his children. But we have this ability to either let him in and do life with him and walk with him, or maybe hold on to certain parts of our life where we want to just kind of be in control and we want to kind of own and say, okay, God, I give you this, but I'm not, I'm not giving you this. Or with this decision, I'm just, I feel like I'm going to make the right one myself and not go off your guidance or your wisdom. We have that same ability. And the, and the thing is, God has, our, our Father has this incredible plan for our lives. All right, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. God's plan for us, our Father's plan for us is good. He wants the best for us, and the thing is, he knows what's best for us because he's God. He can see all. He's past, present, and future. He knows all, and he has this incredible plan for us, but he does not force that on us. He's a loving father, and for those who accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, for those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus, you become this son or daughter of God. You are adopted into this family, and you have this relationship with the Father, but you also can determine what kind of relationship that is, how often you want to walk with the Lord, right? You're saved by grace through faith, but when it comes to following Jesus, you can kind of determine how much you're going to follow, and that's where we're going to dig into, we're going to study the life of Peter Peter, this disciple, we're going to study the life of Peter and the way he followed Jesus. We're going to see some times where he kind of is doubting. We're going to see some faults of his. We're going to see some denial. We're also going to see some immediate following, immediate response out of Peter as well. So if you have a Bible, turn to Mark chapter 1. If you have the Bible app, scroll your way on over there. And if you don't like any of those two methods, we're just going to throw it on the screen for you. Mark chapter 1. And hopefully as we dig through this, we'll learn how to be unashamed of our God and follow Jesus despite any circumstance whatsoever. Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 16, it says this. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Look at 19. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. We have these fishermen. And we even have this, this tax collector. Look at Mark 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he rose and followed him. Three different instances where we've seen Jesus calling his disciples to follow, and we see their immediate response is to drop everything that they're doing and follow him. Now, what's really interesting, let's take these fishermen. So Simon is Peter, Simon Peter, and these fishermen, what are they doing at this moment? They're, they're fishing, or they're on their boats, or mending nets, right? They're doing what uh, their job is, their occupation. And, and anytime we kind of, any kind of, anytime we kind of meet someone, uh, there's a common question we always ask. What do you do for a living, right? We always ask that question, or you're asked that question, because it helps us kind of know the other person. It helps us identify the other person. Some of us, we are rooted in that identity. Like what we do for a living defines us. We like to share with others what we do for a living. I'm a banker. I'm a contractor. I'm a teacher. I'm a, I'm a student. And, and then that kind of identifies us about who we are. So it's, it, it's really even more significant in this scene where Jesus goes up to Peter and he's saying, hey, come follow me. Because what he's really doing is saying, hey, Drop who you are, what you're doing, you fishermen, and come follow me. That, that means Peter is dropping his identity immediately to follow Christ. Now, in order for, 
in order for him to follow, I really feel like, I really feel like he had to have this, this heart that was kind of surrendered over to Christ in order to follow him. And there had to be this recognition of who he was surrendering to. Because like, if, if you came up to me and you're like, hey, hey, Clay, come follow me. I'd be like, why? <laughs> what are you going to do? You're going to mess with me. Like, I'd probably interrogate you thinking you're about to prank me because I might do the same to you, right? Like, you, I, I would not follow you just because you say, hey, come follow me. Now, if you're like, hey, Clay, come follow me. We're going to go eat at Qdoba. I'll say, I surrender. I follow you. Manna from heaven in burrito form. I will follow you. It's, there's an incentive there, right? For Peter, I think he recognizes who's calling him to follow. It's not random, but there's a recogni- recognition of who this is, Jesus. And his heart is also in this place of surrender. He's He's not worried about what's going on with his boat, what's going to happen to his nets. All the fish they caught that day, what are they going to do with them? And he's got all these responsibilities, his buddies, his fishing partners, uh, this guy's dad, he leaves him and to follow Jesus. When you get to this point of surrender, where your heart is in this place of surrender, you're recognizing who you're following, you don't really care about everything else that's going around. You don't really care about your responsibilities or the time, the effort, or what you're about to commit to. These disciples disregard all things that could cause them to hesitate in following Jesus. It's incredible. Sorry, I'm a little sick this weekend, so I'm going to be drinking a lot of water. She might have some awkward silence, awkward pauses. But if we are called to follow Jesus... And we see these disciples as this example of having this heart of surrender, of willing to immediately respond to Christ. Then maybe we should pray to get to that point. And I think we need to be specific in what we pray for. Like when I see that, I'm like, man, I want to do that. But honestly, if I'm real with myself, I'm like, I've got a lot of hesitations. If God just says go or God says speak, I've got some hesitations there, but I want to get to a point where I'm just immediately following Christ. Whatever he calls me to do, whatever he says, I want to do it. And so I think for me, I need to pray for a heart that's in a place of surrender. I need to pray for a mind that's expecting God to call on me. Because what I'll do is I'll get so wrapped up in this world, I'll get so wrapped up in my life, and I'll keep myself busy and busy and busy where I'm not even thinking about God interacting with me. I'm not even thinking about God calling on me and me immediately following. I want to pray for a heart that's willing to respond to God immediately. And when I do that, I will stop asking these questions of, well, what is this going to cost me? How much time is this going to take? What am I really getting myself committed to here? I'll stop asking those questions. Instead, I'll have this heart and mind that's set on following Jesus, and when he calls, I'll say, here I am, send me, right? He says, go, I'll go. He says, uh, he says speak, I'll speak, whatever he's going to have me say. He says, uh, feed him, I'll go feed him. He says, clothe her, I'll go give her my jacket. He says, follow, I immediately follow. But I've got to get into this right posture first. I've got to get into this place of surrender in order to follow Jesus immediately. I need to anticipate God's calling with a heart of surrender. Now, I have this, I have this friend, and I didn't get their permission to use their name. And even if I asked for permission, I know what they'd say, which is no, because they're very humble. So I have this friend Michelle, and, uh, and she, she has these moments a lot with God where she feels like God just placed somebody on her heart, or God just enlightened her mind with this idea, and it's just incredible how perfect the timing is, and, and when she reaches out to this person, uh, just the things that God does out of it, and the ripple effects and ripple effects, it's incredible. She shares these stories, and I'm just like, man, I love that. I feel like her heart and her mind is in anticipation for God to call on her, and she responds 
immediately. She removes all of, all of these things that could cause her to hesitate in God calling on her. She has this heart that's in this place of surrender, and she shares these stories, and I'm like, man, that's amazing that you just immediately acted upon that. Like, I would think, is, is this heartburn, or is this the Holy Spirit? Like, what's going on here? But she's just in this place where she's expecting God to move and interact with his daughter, and she's ready to respond. She's ready to follow. Now, Peter, it's pretty incredible that he follows in an instant. But the thing I love about Peter is that he is far from perfect. I can relate to him very well. He is very much human and imperfect. And as we look further into the story of Peter, uh, we're going to see some things where, yes, he follows, but sometimes he doesn't follow too well. Look at Mark chapter 14. It says, and Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. Jump to 66. And as Peter was below, <clears throat> below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with the Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them, or 70. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. This is kind of a familiar passage of Peter denying Christ. But before we talk about these faults of his, I think it's pretty incredible that these Peter recognize who Peter is. They recognize him as a follower of Jesus. That means Peter's life, he's no longer known as this fisherman. Rather, he's known as a follower of Christ. So much so that people recognize him and know him as a follower of Christ. That's a question we've got to ask ourselves when we're seeing Peter here. Instead of just going straight to the denial, look at Peter. He's, he's being recognized as a follower of Christ. Ask yourself, do people recognize me as a follower of Christ, right? Do people recognize you as a follower of Jesus? We just went through this series called Neighboring, and it's, it's about actively trying to get to know your neighbors, actively living out this command that God has called us to do, love your neighbor as yourself. And as we continue to get to know our neighbors, because we're, we're continuing, just because this series isn't over doesn't mean like, okay, no more neighbor talk anymore. Sorry, that was just three weeks. Sorry. No, as we continue to get to know our neighbors, uh, a question we, we've got to make sure we're asking ourselves is, do they see us and recognize us as a follower of Jesus? The way we interact with them, are, am I identified as the teacher? Am I identified as the banker? Or am I identified more as a follower of Christ? As you get to know others, always remind yourself of this question. What do they see? Do they see clay or do they see Jesus? That's the point we want to get to when we follow Jesus. We want people to see them. We want our identity to be in, rooted in Christ and not us. Do people recognize you as a follower of Jesus? I went to, about three years ago, I went to Israel for a, a study abroad kind of class for my school, and it was an amazing trip. Um, it was hard because <laughs> it was a class, and uh, I had to take quizzes and tests, and I was writing down notes all the time. And But everywhere we went, there's about 30 of us, everywhere we went, People always recognized who we were. They could point us out immediately. They could identify us immediately. Why? Because all of us looked like this. Yeah. You know, like we're all doing the same thing. We have these headphones in because we're listening to our professor as he's like sharing everything that's going around. What is this? What is that? This took place here. This took, I mean, it was amazing. But you could tell the locals just didn't care for us at all. And they could easily identify us 
as these people that they could easily rip off. Like, hey, here's some olive wood. You should buy this, right? But they, they, they recognized us as, these, as people in this tour because of how we were following. We were following our professor. We are constantly moving together as a group and following him, and it was so recognizable. People will recognize you based off who or what you are following. But here, Peter's response is, is pretty interesting. He's recognized as a follower of Jesus. But how does he respond? If we look at that, go back to that, that scripture, um, one before. If you look at that first verse, and Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. How is Peter following there? That, that, that doesn't scream sold out to me, all in. That seems a little fearful. That seems a little ashamed. Peter following Jesus from a distance means he's struggling here to find his identity in Christ. He's a little scared because following Jesus at this moment might cost him his life because he knows what's happening with Jesus. Jesus talked about this. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be killed. Three days later, I'm going to rise again, but all this stuff has to take place first. And Peter, instead of being sold out following Jesus, he's recognized as a follower of Jesus, and he denies it. He's ashamed. Salvation is is free, but following Jesus is going to cost you something. Right? Becoming a son or daughter of the living God, Jesus took care of that on the cross. So by putting your faith in Jesus, everything that he did, not what you did, you become the son and daughter of God. But when it comes to following Jesus, it's going to cost you something. It might cost you some relationships that don't really honor God. It might cost you lifestyle change, right? The way you are financially, instead of just living for self, you're now giving out of your heart for others and love. Jesus may even have this plan for you, or you might have to give up your life for his name. Following Jesus will cost you something. Jesus says this in Mark 8. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Let him deny himself. That, in other words, that's saying life becomes about him and no longer about us. Your identity is rooted in Jesus, not in self. We got a lot of kids in here. Kids, you're at school. You, when I was in school, I, I just wanted to be recognized and accepted, right? Anybody can relate with me on that? I, I wanted to be recognized either as like the stud basketball player, or you might be want to be you might want to be recognized as uh, uh, the 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 one who makes killer grades and works hard to get good grades, or you might want to be recognized as so-and-so's boyfriend or so-and-so's girlfriend. I don't know. You, you, you long for some recognition. You long for acceptance. Now, if we are to follow Jesus, even at school, do your classmates recognize you as a follower of Jesus, or are they recognizing you as this basketball player? or the person who works hard for good grades? What do they recognize you as? And and then let me kind of go a little further further with that. How are you in relation with Peter here? Are you craving acceptance like he is, acceptance from others? At this point, he just wants to be accepted by this group of people and not be thrown into the mix with Jesus? Do we kind of do that at school? We just want to be accepted by others? We don't want to be made fun of? By being a follower of Jesus, everyone's doing this, and you know, man, that's not God honoring. God has a plan for my life. That ain't it. How do we respond to that? Students, how can we take these next steps to become a sold-out follower of Jesus where people recognize you at school as a follower of Christ? Adults, how do we do that at work where they recognize us, our coworkers recognize us, not as what we do, but our identity rooted in Jesus. It's a struggle. Peter struggled with this. But the encouraging thing is, 
God wants us to continue following him even when we struggle. And there's one last story that we'll conclude with, with Peter. And it's just amazing and so encouraging to see this. If you've got a Bible, turn to Matthew 14. In Matthew 14, it says this, And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is a very common passage of Peter walking out on the water with Jesus. But I think what is so significant in this passage, yes, he's, he's having to trust in Jesus as he's following him, despite his circumstances, but he starts struggling with that. He starts looking around, seeing the wind and the waves, and he starts sinking. Yes, I, I, I think what's even more significant is what happens after this, right? Peter struggles here, right in front of everybody, in front of all his friends. He doubts. What they do is they pull up to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, Peter's soaking wet, and they go out onto the land, and here's the kind of conversation I see taking place. They've got ministry to do. Jesus wants the disciples to go gather all these people in the city, bring them all the sick, bring them all the, all, all the people who need to be healed, all the sinners, bring them to me. I'm going to share them who I am and what I can do for them. I could see Peter just probably being beat up because of how embarrassing that was with his struggle, how much he doubted at this moment, trusting in Jesus. He's soaking wet, and he's, he's embarrassed in front of his friends, and I don't, I don't see Jesus looking at him and saying, hey, Peter, we're going we're gonna to go do some ministry here. We're going to go gather these people. Why don't you just sit in the boat and kind of think about what you did, think about your struggles, Maybe think about, I don't know, how you can get right and then come join us to do some ministry, to come love on these people. I don't think Jesus would have said that because what I see is Peter and the rest of the disciples going out and doing ministry. Despite Peter's embarrassment, despite Peter's struggles, despite Peter's like sadness and despair of what he just did, he's soaking wet and he's going out and Jesus is saying, let's go, get out of the boat. Come on, I know you just struggle with that, but I'm still calling you to follow. I'm still calling you to go love on people. I'm still calling you to go neighbor. I'm still calling you to follow me. Get out of the boat. And when we struggle, God is still calling you to follow. So continue to follow him even when you struggle. I know it's hard. I know it's embarrassing. But if we just stay stuck in our despair, in our depression, in our guilt, we will put such a weight on it where we won't move. We will stay. And that is not God's plan for your life. Jeremiah 29 11, that's not God's plan for your life. God has this incredible plan for you. He wants to use you. So even when you mess up, or even when you fall short, or even when you struggle, get out of the boat. Even though you're soaking wet, follow. Continue to follow, because God still wants to use you. God has incredible plans for your life. I know this is the cheesiest thing ever, and you should make fun of me for this. If you don't, I will after this. But it, don't wallow. Instead, follow, right? I know, I know. Shame me on Facebook. I totally will. But God does not want you to wallow in your sin. He does not want you to stay in the state of depression. He's got such incredible plans for you. Follow Jesus, even though you feel this guilt, even though you feel this, this despair and depression. Maybe ask God, hey, help me out here. I know you paid for it on the cross already, so I don't want to remind myself over and over of my shortcomings. That's been paid for on the cross. Help me follow you. Help me move my feet, Lord. 
Help me dry up because I'm soaking wet here. But help me follow you and love on people. That's the most amazing thing about the gospel is you don't have to get things right before you come to Jesus. He's the one who makes you right. He's the one who makes you perfect because of what he's done, not what you did. So if you are saved by grace through faith in Jesus, you're an adopted son or daughter of the living God. He's got incredible plans for you. Let's get a heart that's anticipating him to move and interact in our lives. Let's get a mind that's expecting him to communicate. And let's always remind ourselves, man, I want to be recognized as a follower of Jesus. What are some steps I can take where people recognize me as a follower of Jesus? Not for my glory, but for his glory. Pointing, pointing people not to you, but to him because your identity is rooted in Christ. Let's stand together. I want to remind you that next Sunday, we will have a kids FAQ panel. Our Live Oak kids and teens have submitted these questions, and a lot of these questions uh, are some of these questions that adults have too. And so we're going to have this panel, we're going to dig through these questions, and we're going to wrestle with these topics. It's going to be a really, really different kind of service, but it's going to be really cool. I'm excited for it. So make sure you come back this next Sunday, the 18th. Uh, 9 30 and 11 it's a family Sunday as well so kinder through fifth will be with us again super excited that you guys are with us let's pray heavenly father thank you for loving us God we don't deserve it we haven't earned it but you love us and you pursue us and nothing we can do can change that God you have these incredible plans for us and that's what we want, but we kind of hinder ourselves. We get in the way of what you've called us to do. Sometimes we have a hard time following God because we are imperfect and we are selfish. So God, we ask for a new heart and a new mind set on Christ. God, help us be expecting you to call on us. And God, give us this heart of surrender Give us this posture that we're in where we immediately respond to you. We drop everything that we're doing and we follow you. And God, please remind us in the times where we mess up or we struggle or we're, we're kind of growing a little distant from you or we're kind of determining our relationship with you. Please remind us of your grace and what it covers and how sufficient it is. And help us continue following you despite our guilt and depression and despair. Help us give that over to you to fulfill the plan and purpose you have for our lives. We love you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.